Amen. Morning. Morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Thanks for being here. Um, special thanks to uh, Dale and Kathy and Christopher, Alan and John as well. Um, it's great to. It's been great to meet them and, and know more about what they do in their hearts. Um, the cool thing is getting to just chat with them a little bit. I know that they don't do this um, just to do it. It's, it's something that is driven by God's love for them to do. And it's awesome when we uh, get a chance to encounter people that are moved and compelled like that. Um, I think it was Paul. Paul said, he said, it's the love of God that compels us. And I think that's, there's no better motivation than, than God's love to move us forward. Um, I, I know... I think I'm probably speaking for most of us here this morning. It's been, how many of you would say it's been a really, really full week? Anybody? How many of those that didn't raise your hand, you need more to do, and I've got plenty of it. So um, I'll talk to you. I will find you. Actually, we won't let you leave until... No, I'm just kidding. Well, um, no. Uh, I think it's... Uh, I think a lot of you have seen... Um, I've seen you... Uh, you've had your schedules... Um, your lives rearranged. Some of you have had your, your very lives rearranged and your schedules rearranged because of flooding. Personally, you've, you've encountered some stuff and you've, it's kind of rearranged everything. A lot of you, many of you, have, have voluntarily rearranged your lives and rearranged your schedules in order to be help to people who, who were experiencing uh, the, the, these floods. Um, there's still some of you that are very much in the middle of rearranging right now. And it may not have anything to do with uh, the flood, but it may have a whole lot to do with other things that are just kind of seem to be just descending in, in, in kind of deluge fashion into your life. And you're, and you're having to figure out how to rearrange and how to, how to, how to change schedules. And you're kind of in the middle of that, of that process right now. So this morning, um, I thought in the middle of all the changing, rearranging, um, I'd like to take us this morning to just a familiar passage of Scripture, right? So if, with everything else kind of like, oh, this is crazy, it's like, I'm not going to read some obscure passage out of Ezekiel to you this morning. You're like, I don't know what any of this means anymore. We're going to go somewhere familiar probably. And, and for some of you, most of you, if you've been here at Cornerstone for at least the time, this should be fairly familiar because we were in this passage a couple months ago in our series, I Have Decided. Um, but this morning... I'd like for us to, to maybe revisit and reframe the familiar. You ever, you ever have that happen? Um, if, you're, if you're a Bible reader, you ever, ever read the Bible and, and, and you read a passage and it's incredibly familiar to you and then you come back to it at some other point and all of a sudden this verse that's so familiar and, and you feel like you know all the nuts and bolts and the ins and outs of it, all of a sudden it speaks to you in a different way. Um, one, that's the Holy Spirit working, which is amazing. But it's an amazing thing that sometimes we can come back across a, a very familiar passage of Scripture and be reminded or, or be shown something new. And so I'm hoping that's what happens this morning, that w as we revisit this familiar passage of Scripture, we're going to ask God to help kind of reframe it and help us see this passage with some fresh eyes. And I thought it was incredibly important kind of appropriate with the opportunity um, to meet a lot of folks from Samaritan's Purse and Connected Ministries that, that we revisit that story of the Good Samaritan that Jesus told in Luke 10. So if you have a Bible, I typically say if you have a Bible or Bible app, this morning if you have a Bible app, you're hosed. Um, our, our network is down. The internet is not working properly. Um, so um, we'll have the verses up here as well. But um, if you're used to just grabbing your app, I'm, I apologize. I, I'm, I'm in the same boat with you. Um, but I, I want us to just kind of look at this familiar story and, and maybe see what God may speak to us today. So we're going to just dive right in. Here we are. Luke 10, starting in verse 25. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. And I want you to understand something. This is, I always think this is so interesting because this expert, he's going to ask a question in a minute. I personally don't believe he had any desire to know the answer to this question. I believe what he wanted is he wanted Jesus to know how much he knew. He just wants Jesus to know and all the people in the crowd around Jesus to know how much he knew. That's, that's really kind of the underlying current of this question. It's not a question that's seeking truth and seeking answer and seeking, seeking something deep that would, that would settle into his heart. This is a question that he's hoping he's going to help Jesus know how much he knows and the others around him, Right? And so he asks this question. He stands up to test Jesus' teacher. He asks, what must I do to inherit inter eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? And he, the lawyer, answered, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Great answer, right? Like best answer. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up in Sunday school and we used to always say like when people ask questions, we just said Jesus and 99% of the time that was the right answer. This actually is the right answer. Like what's the most important thing you can do? That. What, he, he has the right answer. Watch Jesus' reply here real quick because this is, this is good. He says, you've answered correctly. In, in essence, great. You know the right answer. But then look what he says. Do this and you will live. And I thought, that, I thought this was so amazing. Jesus' response is so short, but it is so powerful. He said, do this. Not talk about this. Not know this. Not even believe this. Not prepare lessons and messages and sing songs about this. Certainly nothing wrong with those things, but let me just share with you something. Those things do not counter, those things do not make up for not doing this. They don't. And and I think somewhere along the line, we, as long as this, as well as this guy, gets the idea that if, well, if we just talk about loving God and loving people, you know, if we just bring people into a place where we can teach them about loving God and loving people, that somehow we're actually loving God and loving people, and you're not. That's not what he said. He didn't say that. He said, do it. Do this, and you will live. And Jesus, here, let me help us understand what Jesus wasn't saying, right? He wasn't saying that we do things to gain eternal life. What he was saying to this lawyer, what he was saying to all of us, is that a real love and a real relationship with God produces real love and real relationships with others. That's what he says. That's what he's helping us understand, that a real love and a real relationship with a real God produces real love and real relationships with other real people. In other words, grace received results in grace reflected. That, that's, that's the idea. That, that when we receive, it should be reflected back to those that we come into contact with. Let's push in. But, of course there's a but. Because we're human. And when Jesus says do this, we have a but. Well, like that but. We all have, never mind. Um, <laughs> But he, the lawyer, right, wanted to justify himself. He what? He wanted, to, he wanted to make sure that what he believed and what he said was just as important as what he did. He wanted to justify himself. He wanted to make sure that his belief and his words mattered more than his actions. That I know the answers. And I believe the right things, right? And and because he wants to justify himself, because he wants to make sure that what he believes and what he says matters more than what he does, he asked Jesus, so who's my neighbor? Right? And, And if you were here a few weeks ago when we looked at this passage, you'll remember that we said this. It is not possible to love your neighbor and not know who they are. It's not. You cannot love your neighbor and not know your neighbor. And if you think you can, let me just help you. You're justifying yourself. You're justifying yourself. And if we ask, hey, how are you loving your neighbor? Well, I don't really know my neighbor. Then let me help you understand something really quick. It's not, real, it's not rocket science. Then you're not loving your neighbor. Well, I don't know my neighbor. You're right. You probably don't. And you're not lo- so therefore, you're not loving them. And Jesus said what? I think you should really contemplate loving them. I think you should really have a Bible study about loving them. I think we should all cuddle in a group and and talk about how we could love them. No, he said, go do it. Do it. No excuses. No justification. Just do it. The expert in the law absolutely knew what God's word said. Here's the part that's so, I'll be personally honest, disgusting. 
There was no confusion about what God's word said. He knew what it said. He just didn't do what it said. And in, in the process of all of this, he, he wanted to justify the not doing of it or find some other thing he was doing to cover up for what he's not doing. It doesn't fly. I mean, you, you may explain it to yourself and believe yourself that that's that, that covers it, but it doesn't fly because that's not what Jesus said. He didn't say, hey, do it unless you have something else to do, which will make up for the not doing of this thing. Nope. Doesn't show up. It's not in scripture. So if that's where you're at, just, just so I can help you know, you're justifying yourself. You're covering up. And, and I know that's not where you're at. I know that's not where you want to be. I just want you to understand maybe sometimes that's where we get to sometimes. In our, in our thinking. And here's the thing. We are so prone to do the same thing that this lawyer did. Know God's word. Just don't do God's word, but figure out a way to finagle what we are doing to make it look like we're doing what Jesus actually wants us to do. We'll show up on a Sunday, hear about, talk about, discuss God's word. Probably quote some verses. But what God wants for us, according to Jesus and according to James 1.22, is for us to be doers of the word. In other words, discuss less, do more. Discuss less, do more. It's just the reality. And, and I think we need to be kind of aware and, and understand. Paul tells us this in, in 1 Corinthians 1.8, that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I, I've, I'll be honest with you, I've met some of the most incredibly knowledgeable people in Scripture that I think lo they love their knowledge more than they love people. They love the fact that they can quote Scripture, but they won't love people. They could quote the Scripture like the lawyer did. What should we do? We should love the Lord our God with all our heart, our mind, soul, strength, and we should love our neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? I don't know. What? <laughs> See, love requires action. It's so easy to become students of compassion. We love stories written about it and movies made about it. We can be moved by and applaud those who practice it, but we have not shown compassion to anyone unless we act on it. Just like connecting dots, right? And now Jesus is going to tell a story of what real love and real compassion looks like. Here's, here's what it actually looks like. If, in case we're confused, in case we, we're, we're, we're delusional and, and, we're, and we're fooling ourselves into thinking that, hey, just coming and sitting in a seat and doing churchy things is what God wants us to do. In case we're confused about it, Jesus is like, I'm going to just tell you a story. So maybe this makes a little more sense for you. In, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. You mean stuff happens to people that they weren't expecting and they weren't planning for and it just knocks them off their feet? You mean that actually happens? Hello? Right? Yeah. Put this together, guys. Just put it in context here, right? They stripped him of his clothes. I saw all kinds of clothes piled up on a curb. Beat him. And went away leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down on the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. And in these two verses, Jesus basically sums up why the vast majority of the world has an issue with religion. Particularly Christianity. He just summed it up. In, in two verses, Jesus just summed up why the vast majority of the world has a problem with Christianity. It's that. It's that. It's because those who claim to love God fail to truly love others. It's because actions speak louder than words. It's because no one is impacted by all the love you may have in your heart when it never makes it to them from your hands. That's why. That's exactly why. This is not mysterious. Jesus is just kind of so plain spoken about this. No one is impacted by all the love we have in our hearts if it's not evidenced through our hands, especially when we're aware that someone needs help. 
right? He just pointed us to that. Somebody needed help. And it was, it was made aware of these. They saw them. They saw that they needed help. And they passed by on the other side. And, and here's the thing. I don't believe the priest nor the Levite lacked passion. I just believe they had some seriously messed up priorities. I don't believe they lacked passion. I think they were passionate about a lot of stuff. None of which ultimately mattered in the grand scheme of God's kingdom work. I don't think they lacked passion. They just had some messed up priorities. They were focused and they were passionate about the wrong things. And, and, and what they would do, much like that lawyer, is they would justify their passion. They would, they would justify why that needed to be done, why they needed to pass that person up, why they needed to ignore that person in need because there was other stuff to do. Let me tell you, Jesus said, do this. And the this wasn't whatever the other thing was. The this was loving God and loving others. Maybe, maybe like us, they were busy people with plans to accomplish and places to go and projects to complete. But here's the thing, you guys. When God's people ignore people, especially people in need, we send the message that they are not a priority to us, nor to God. I, I don't even know if we understand the ripple effect of our action. And, and, and that can be in a good way. I'm going to share that with you at the end. Like You're like, but gosh, pastor's just like hammering at us. I need us to understand some stuff. Because somewhere in the mix of all the doing and, and going and the busyness, sometimes... Oftentimes, not oftentimes, but sometimes, we forget what's most important. Jesus had a whole issue with an entire church that was kind of that way. He said, man, you like teachings and doctrines and church polity and perpetuity and I can't think of another P word right now, but whatever. You know, all that, you love that, but I have a problem with you. And the problem is you don't love people. You've left your first love, meaning what? Well, that means we forgot to love Jesus. Let me just share it with you. You guys know this, right? Jesus tells us, you can't love him and not love other people. So the problem in that church wasn't their love for church. The problem in that church was they didn't love people. And here's what Jesus said should probably happen. You should probably repent. You should probably change your mind and change your direction and change your action and let God change your heart. Because the stuff you think so incredibly important doesn't matter if people are going ignored. That's what he's saying. When God's people ignore people, especially people in need, we send the message that they're not a priority to us, nor to God. Let me give you an idea. It's, it's like the builder of a hospital stepping over somebody beaten and bruised because they're too busy finishing building the hospital. Do, do you guys not see the hypocrisy in that? Do you not like go, like that doesn't make sense whatsoever. I, I'll be the first one to say, I wouldn't go to that hospital because he cares more about the structure than the person. We cannot talk about the love of God or build programs to teach others about the love of God, yet ignore the very people in our community who need to see the love of God in action. It's just, it's, it's not, it's not right. And there's no justification to it. And, and, and we're so human and we're going to spin it and we're going to twist it. And we're going to, no, there's no justification to it because Jesus said, do this. I'm just going to go with what he said. My first pastor, grandfather used to say, I'd much rather see a sermon than hear one any day. There's a lot of truth there. The cool thing is, there's been a lot of people preaching great sermons this week. And they haven't said a whole lot. But they've been doing a lot. And that's a good thing. And now Jesus, he kind of shares the pivotal part of this story, right? He, he gives us kind of the, 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 the transition of, here's what these guys did, but, but a Samaritan... As he traveled, what did he do? He went. He came to where the man was. You mean he, he didn't stay detached and, and self-distracted? And, and No, no, he, he, he came where the man was. And when he 
saw him, looked at him. He felt compassion for him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And I'm telling you, I think we could park here for days because this is what love and action looks like. This is what real ministry is. See, see, love steps out. Real love causes us to step out and step away from our routines and our schedules, to step out of our comfort zones, to step away from our projects and our programs and our personal problems to truly see others. That's what real love does. That's what true love does. That's what God's love does. It steps out of the routine and it, it, it compels us to see others. There's something incredible that happens when we step towards someone in pain and look them in the face. And you stand or you sit shoulder to shoulder with them as they share some heartbreaking things and, 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 and just, just kind of unload. I appreciate it with, I think Christopher said earlier and I think Kathy reiterated that sometimes the most powerful thing you can do with somebody in need is just sit with them. Just sit with them. Just listen to him. There's a great example in scripture that, that helps us understand that, right? How many of you know the story of Job? We know the story of Job? Like worst day in the history of days, right? Everything went fine until his three friends tried to explain why God did what he did. And then it went to heck in a handbasket. It was like the best thing they could have done was stay silent. Like sometimes that's the best thing you can do is just be silent, listen to what they want to say and, and how they're feeling. And, and somewhere in that, in that opportunity, there will be an opportunity, I believe, that God will help you bridge the gap with his love and his grace and his gospel. Somewhere in there. But that's what love does. Love steps out. It, it allows us to really, truly see others. And then, believe it or not, hopefully, it compels us to feel for them. I'll be honest with you, there's something seriously wrong if you haven't spent hours and hours and time and time on your knees crying to God for, the, for what these people have been going through. There's something wrong. There's something seriously wrong if what these people are experiencing that breaks their hearts doesn't break your heart. Like you and God got to get some stuff right because there's something wrong there. And then love steps in. It steps out, it allows us to see, it allows us to feel, and then it steps in ministering where we can, helping where we're able, giving of ourselves and our time and our energy and our resources in order to share God's love with others. I love this next part, right? Then he, the Samaritan, put the injured man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, packed, patted him on the back, said good luck and told him I'd be praying for you. That what he did? Why am, oh, we're, why are we like way down there? There we go. You're like, the people are like, I don't know, maybe that's what he did. I can't read this verse. <laughs> maybe he took him to an inn and he patted him on the back and said, I'll pray for you. No, he didn't. He actually put him on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. Which required time and commitment. And not a, oh yeah, here you go, see you later, good luck. took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, or two days wages, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. have. You may have. The Samaritan not only made sure that this man was cared for in his absence, he promised to follow up when he personally returned. He promised that he was going to follow up with him when he personally returned. That's important. I love, I love what the Chapa ministry is doing. That, hey, they're making contacts, but then they're like, hey, we're going to be leaving. We want to make sure there's somebody there that's going to continue to follow up and care. And then Jesus asked this really pointed question. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The ones that stepped away or stepped around, or stepped to their project they had to complete, or their program that they were trying to launch, or the one who actually stepped in. Who do you think was the neighbor? The expert in the law was fairly sharp. He said the one who had mercy on him. 
The one who didn't critique and complain or check his calendar, but the one who showed compassion. And Jesus said, you should gather with a bunch of other Jesus followers and sit in a building and talk about this. He said, go. Go and do it. But I don't have a real plan. Yeah, but those are real people who are really hurting. So why don't you go and love them? Like I do. Let me just help us, just in case we're like, you've been you're like overwhelmed with, you know, spin in your various experiences in church. Let me just help us understand. This was not figurative. That's not figurative language. <laughs> All right? So just so we understand Bible, Jesus wasn't talking figuratively. This wasn't a suggestion. This was a command. It was a command. He, here's, here's why. Here's why the story of the Good Samaritan is such an important story. It's because of this. It's because it's a snapshot of the gospel. That's why it's so important. I mean, and it's moving, right? You can't, almost everybody, no matter their religious background or experience, has heard of this story, which is pretty amazing. Like, they may not really know who Jesus is, but they've heard the story by Jesus. And, and you know why it's so crucial and why it's so important? One, it moves us because compassion moves us. But the reason it's so important is because it's a snapshot of the gospel. This was a good story that should point us to God's story. Here's the thing. We're the ones. We're the ones battered and bruised. We're the ones not in need of a Samaritan but in need of a savior. Here's, here's how Paul puts it in Romans 5. He says it this way. He says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. In, in, in the words of my friend, Pastor Rashad Cunningham, let that breathe. Rashad always says that. Like he'll share a verse. He said, well, just let that breathe. Let that breathe. We were not occasional mistakers in need of correction. We were utterly helpless sinners in need of a savior. And Jesus came seeking to save us. That's why this story is so important. Because it's a snapshot of the gospel. Let's, move, let's press on. Paul's not done. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. Most people wouldn't set aside their calendar to go help somebody that's in need. Most people, would, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good, who we believe might deserve it. But here's the thing, God isn't like most people. And his, his love has nothing to do with the good in us because compared to him, none of us are good. His love, his mercy, his compassion, and his grace has everything to do with his goodness, not ours. His love is different. God isn't like most people. I don't believe followers of God should be like most people. Here's what happened. But God, what? Talked about, studied, prepared a lesson, sang, met in a huddle, said, you know, we should. No, he says, but God showed his great love for us. How? By sending Christ to die for us. When? While we were getting our act together. Well, well we, were, we were turning the corner and we were believing and we were behaving and we were doing, no, not at all. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. In the middle of being devastated and broken in a mess, God steps into our mess. And let me just share with you, most of the time, that's where we meet God, is in the middle of our messes. But the problem is, in order for somebody to meet God in the middle of their messes, sometimes they need an introduction. And if our calendars rule our compassion, then they may not be introduced. When we least deserve God's grace and God's love, he demonstrated his great love for us, and he sent us more than a good Samaritan. He sent us a Savior. And we have a Savior that is so similar to the Samaritan in Jesus' story. We have a Savior who has come to seek us and to save us because we could not save ourselves. And I know, I was talking with Christopher just a little bit ago, 
This is a fiercely independent group of people in this state. Like, like if it's going to be done, I'm going to do it. And, and I get that. And to a certain degree, I applaud that. I mean, that's awesome. But there are just some things that you need help with. One, if you need your basement cleaned out, right? Like, let's get some, there's people here to help. There's, but beyond that, in this context, in this, in this application, you can't save yourself. You can't save yourself. So we needed a savior. There's no self-saving in God's economy. We have a savior that freely gives and sacrificially loves so we could live. Much like that Samaritan. Freely gave, sacrificially loved so he could live. And he doesn't just bandage us up, leave us alone, but he provides us with ongoing care and companionship and comfort. Right? Matter of fact, he says, I'll even give you my comforter. One more thing, and I don't know if you caught this in the story, but we have a savior, much like the Samaritan, who promised that he's coming back. I think that's powerful. See, this story is so important because it's a snapshot of the gospel. But this story is also incredibly important because it's an example of how Jesus followers follow Jesus. And we use that term a lot. It's like churchy term. Well, you just need to follow Jesus. And people that have don't know what that means. We're like, what, what does that mean? Like, I don't see him. I don't know how to walk. But what? This is how we follow Jesus. We understand who he loves and how he loves, and that's what we do. That's how we go. Through this story, Jesus helps us see that love isn't just an idea to discuss or a word to define. It's not a religious ritual that we repeat on Sundays. It's not a commodity that we trade based on the perceived worth of others or what we think we'll get back from them. Love is a gift that we give. John says it this way. 1 John 3, 18. He says, Dear children, we must not love with just words or speech, but with truth and action. I'm kind of old, so to quote a really old Michael W. Smith lyric, love isn't love until you give it away. It's not. It's a great idea. It's a wonderful discussion piece. It's not love. It's not love until it's given away. Jesus points us to the ultimate example and the ultimate truth when he says it this way. For God so loved the world, he wrote a book about it. He sat in a Bible study. He busied himself with a hundred other projects. No. God so loved the world that he gave. And God loves so much that he gave us more than just a book to read or some words to help. He gave us himself. He stepped out of heaven and into our world. He truly and fully sees us and he's not disappointed or disgusted by us. Instead, he's moved with compassion for us and then he reaches to us. That's, that's how God loves. He steps into our mess and into our brokenness and he rescues us personally. I just love this whole thing. The Samaritan, I don't know what his deal was. I don't know what his livelihood was. I don't know his whole story. But I have to think it could have been easier for him to go, you know, I'll get back to this guy. I mean, he needs some help. I'm going to go home and I'll go send a proxy. But that's not what he did. He saw someone broken and in need of help and he personally comes to that person, which is a snapshot of what God has done for us. But it's also how Jesus followers follow Jesus. Like, well, I see that you need some help. I'm going to go talk to a bunch of people and see if we can get a committee. What? Like, go help. Here's how, here's how God did it, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave. He, he saw. He loved. He gave. That whoever believes shall not perish but have eternal life. And I love this because when we believe, not when we behave, not when we're baptized, not when we become a churchgoer, but when we believe, we receive. And when we receive grace, we become reflectors of grace. I think sometimes we forget what we've received. And therefore, we have a difficult time reflecting what we've received. And I know life gets busy and things overwhelm us and there's so much to do, but... This story was about plain, evident, disastrous need. 
That's what the story was about. This wasn't about, hey, you should just go, go looking all over the place to find need. This was, hey, this, this need was evident. It was, it was right in the open. It was obvious what the need was. That's what, this, that's what it is. It's, it's about receiving grace when we were the ones in need and then reflecting that same grace. As I was praying and, and preparing for this morning, God, God seemed to be pressing on my heart this thought, and it was basically this. Let them know that I love them more than they will ever understand. And I need them to love other people more than they ever thought was possible. It was just that. It was let them know that I love them. Even in the middle of the mess, in the flood, in the crazy, in the rearranging, that I love them. And I need them to love other people more than they could ever imagine. I'm gonna, we're going to wrap up with these verses and we're done this morning. But I thought I would wrap up with these challenging and encouraging words from John in 1 John 4. Here's what John says. He says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. Listen to this next line though. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. John didn't say, if, if you're not loving, you're not a child of God. He said, that relationship you have isn't changing you any. That relationship you have sounds good to talk about, but it's not changing what you're doing. Let me just put it back in Jesus' story, right? If we don't love our neighbor... I don't think we know who God is. You don't know who God is. You, you've, you've created your own version. And whatever that version is, it's an idol. You're worshiping something that isn't God because God said that my children that know me are going to love people. They're going to love others. And, and love requires action. Not discussion, not book reading, action. God showed. Wow, he did something. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he loved us so much that he gave us his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. This is such a powerful truth to receive how much God loves us that he saw us broken and in need and he sets everything else aside because the only thing that mattered was that, was people in need. He set everything else aside to make sure he can minister to those that he truly loved. And it's, it's not about how well we love, it's the fact that he loved us. Such a powerful truth to receive, but here it is. Such a compelling truth to reflect. Dear friends, right? He's, he's making an argument. He's reaching a concu- conclusion. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love one another. No one has ever, and then he changes, like, right? Isn't this weird? It's almost like he, he turns the corner, like it's a different thought that starts to enter in his mind. Since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. Like it, just like it bounced into John's head. He's, you know, I, when I think about it, no one's ever seen God. Wait a second. But if we love each other, that God who lives in us, his love is brought to full expression in us, through us. So, so what are we saying? What, John, what are you saying? What he's telling us is that as Christians, we are the only living expressions of a loving God. You are the living expression of a loving God. So what do you love? I don't know. We need to get our love right. And what I'm learning is if we'll get our love right, God helps us get everything else right. It doesn't mean we're, it's going to be perfect. We're still living in an imperfect world, and we are dealing with our own imperfect selves. 
but I believe we can be filled with God's love and his joy and his peace and his patience and his goodness, his kindness. We can, we can be filled with his purpose and his grace and his generosity. And this morning, I'm not sure what you came in needing, but what I do know for sure is we need God's love to fill us. Maybe, maybe you just need to be reminded of all of the links that God went to to demonstrate his love to you personally. And, and, and then maybe not only allowing God to fill our lives with his love, but allowing God's love to flow from our lives. And that's exactly what God wants. He wants the same thing. He wants our lives full and our lights shining. That's what he wants. And that doesn't happen when our priorities get messed up. When we prioritize things and programs and projects over people. It doesn't happen. Here's a cool thing we get to experience as church. Um, it's when God adds more lights to his candlestick here at Cornerstone. So your wife just stepped out, did she? All right, somebody help Kim out. She's got a little baby. I'm going to have Derek and Kim come up real quick. There she is. You can bring her up. Bring Cora up. Nice. So I am... There we go. I'm going to have Derek and Kim come up. Um, some of you got a chance to get to know Derek and Kim. Um, hopefully, you'll get a chance to know them better in the, uh, in the coming days and weeks and months and years, we hope, decades. Come on up. Come on up. They can see you. But I, their, their desire was to, to be a part here of Cornerstone.